You want an alternate and different way to keep the bottoms of your fence pickets from rotting, built in such a way that your weed eater doesn't damage those pickets when you go to mow, and you want something that's different than what your neighbors have. And no, this is not some modified version of a rot board that goes along the bottom. And you want this alternate way to be something a DIYer like you and I can build easily? Well, come along with me while I do just that. Okay, so for my forms, I'm using three quarter inch plywood. And I got two sheets here, or four by eight, that are clamped together. The reason I'm using plywood is because I want my uh, pour to be a, a full four inches thick versus getting like a one by four and it being three and a half. And then you want to get a one by six and then cut all that off in that waste. So I got three quarter inch plywood. I don't have a track saw, but I got a skill saw here. And I got a, a basically a, a straight edge, if you will, you can clip together. And I got it set. Four. So when my saw sits on here and the blade, it cuts it at four inches and I'm cutting uh, two pieces uh, at a time. <clears throat> that way they're matched. So these two will be one form versus cutting one sheet and come back and cutting another sheet. I want them all, each one to be a match. So if there's just a hair variance, it won't matter. Now I got a board under here to support this that I keep moving in. So we'll get these finished. And we can start putting the forms together. Center to center, seven foot, and I'm cutting an inch off of that. So I got it marked at six foot 11. That gives me a half inch at each of the end for play. And so instead of measuring all these out, I rigged me up a little stop system so I can just cut all of them and they'll all work. And if you're wondering what that is, that's my brand, brand new 3M extractor dust collection system that I'm trying out. I have a link for that video if you want to see it. I just slide my boards up against my little stop. And just like that, all my boards are cut. Now let's move on to getting them set up. Now it's time to get the other side of my form set. I've got a string line that starts here and goes all the way down to that end and it runs right next to the edge of the cement on each post. You can see I got this side already set and I got it back filled with dirt um, and all set up. Now, what I've done is, is I've put a block here and here, and I've screwed it to this side. And I've got it as close to here as I can get, and the same there. That way it holds my form so my form can't possibly move if these have any kind of wiggle to them. Now, when I set this, I've got my four inch strip of plywood, and I've got the best side facing towards the form. And what I'm gonna do is set this in here and take a clamp, clamp these up, now each one of these blocks has got a five inch center mark. I want my board at least an inch, well, half inch at least, to that side of the line on this one. Now the reason I'm clamping these is I want this to pull against tight against this side. And then when I screw this down in here, it'll hold it in there tight. And it'll hold it up to the level that I need it. What I'll do is take and pre-drill a hole because if I don't, it will split this. And I'm just using inch and five eighths deck screws or exterior screws, if you will. Now, where my string comes in is if the board is bowed in or bowed out, I can adjust that. What I'm gonna do is have a stake at each end and then two through the center. So I'll put my one at the end first because it's completely set and isn't going to move. Now I do my best to drive these straight down and in. And that's why I'm pushing them in as far as they'll go. Doesn't always work, but I do the best I can at getting it that way. I want this stake below the level of my plywood. Then I pre-drill because if I don't, it'll the screws will split the wood. And again, I'm just using inch and five eighths screws. They'll probably stick through a little bit, but that's okay. I got those two sets, and then these two, I'll just kind of guesstimate right in here. But you can see my string line is inside, it's not on the edge. So what I'm gonna do is this board's 10 inches wide. I'm gonna put it in there, right where the braces are on the other side. And it's got it pushed out, and you see my string line's right against that edge. We'll put a stake here, pre-drill, sink a screw. 
Now you can see this string line is pretty darn close to sitting on the edge of this board. And I'm okay with that. That'll work because probably by the time I get concrete in here and vibrate, it'll push these out a little bit. Now that one's all set. Simply rinse and repeat for eight more times. So I'll get these all in. Then we'll come back and backfill like I did that side. We'll be just that much closer to getting ready to pour this. I've got all my form set for this side. Now it's time to backfill. And I'm basically using the dirt that I had stockpiled from when I dug all this stuff out. And then I'm just taking and dumping it in here. Now, when I fill this, I'm not filling it clear to ground level. I'm only filling it to the bottom of my form. That's all I want to fill for right now. Now I got boards in here at 10 inches to hold the, the uh, distance just to be safe even though my stakes are in there. I'm using this piece of plywood and basically what I do is I stick this plywood down inside here and hold it. I take a block of wood here and basically I just start compressing it down in there because if I didn't it would do that and I just work my way down then I take a hammer and make sure I push it back so I'm gonna go through here and do this all the way down now it's time to put in some limestone packing now you can see in some of these the holes are pretty deep I originally was going to fill some of that with mud because I only wanted a couple inches of this pack but honestly it's just gonna be too much work and I don't want to do it so I'm going to just fill all of it with limestone pack. Basically, I'm just going to shovel this in, fill this up. Now, what I'll do is, is I've got a board cut here. It's nine and a half inches wide, so it fits inside there. And the depth is going to be three and seven eighths. Take and screen it like this at an angle. It doesn't matter if that's more than my four inches because I'm going to pack it. Once I get it packed, I'll stick this down in here and run it straight across. I'll get my three and seven eighths. I'm going that extra eighth inch just to have the packing up on top of the, or above the form, so I don't have any worry about concrete bleeding under, even though I got mud packed on the back side. So I've got an eight and a 10 inch plate packer. So I'm going to kind of get it packed with the eight like this. Now that I got it kind of packed in with my eight, inch. Let's put the 10 inch in there. And this one packs it even tighter and harder. Take my board. That's way too low. So I'll have to fill some more. As you can see I got the gravel packed in all of them and filled and I went through and took a brush and cleaned the insides of the forms and the face of the concrete to get any dust and dirt off of that. Now I've got just two things left before I can pour, and they're actually kind of critical, really. So stick with me, and we'll show you what those are. Now, in case you didn't know, everything has an expansion and contraction to it, whether it be wood, metal, concrete, plastic, you name it. It all has some sort of expansion and contraction to it, depending on the temperature of the material or the outside that the material's in, and concrete's no different. And so my worry is if I just pour this like this against these slabs already here, that over time with that expansion and contraction motion, that either A, it's going to cause chipping or cracking of either one of these, or B, my border part's going to start to shift and move because of it. And I don't want that. I've got this nice and packed real tight. I want it to stay in place. So how are we going to address that? Well, we're going to address it with this material right here. And what is this material? Come on, I'll show you. Well, what this material is, is basically concrete expansion board. Now, I don't really know what it's made of. It looks like it's some sort of fibrous material that's kind of tar impregnated. But what it does is, is it allows forgive or just what I'm doing it for, expansion and contraction. Now, I got this at my local Home Depot. It comes four inches wide by five foot long, and it's supposed to be about a half inch thick. And this stuff is fairly easy to cut. Basically, I'm just gonna take, measure 10 inches, make a mark with my utility knife here, take my square, I wanna make sure I cut a good square edge, and just score over it several times. 
just like that. Alrighty, I take the boards that I cut, I put them in here, and I want to make sure that they're level against the top. And if they're not, I've got my little five-in-one painter's tool, if you will, and I just kind of clean out the a groove, if you will, down in there. A little added extra overkill, whatever you want to call it, OCD, don't care. I'm taking my uh, tarring, uh, liquid tarring material, and I'm painting the surface of this concrete. Now, you're asking why in the world would you do that? Well, a couple reasons. One, because I'm anal and OCD. And two, the biggest reason really that I'm doing this is to try and prevent, with this stuff in here, I'm hoping it'll prevent any weed growth up in between here is what I'm really kind of hoping for. That, and it helps glue this to here while I get it fastened, as you'll see here in a second. Now I'm careful not to go up here because I don't want it to show. And I'm careful not to go past the corner so it shows on the front. I do the same thing to the face of this. And again, this is just to help glue it to it and stick it in place so it doesn't move until I get it fastened in place. I'm taking a 5 30 seconds bit and I'm drilling through the plywood and into the expansion joint. Then I'm just taking some 4D inch and a half finished nails and sliding it in the hole. I'm leaving the head stick out so I can pull it out later, just like that. I'll do the other side. I'll come back down the other side and do it, but it's flush here. It's glued against here really good. It's flush over here. When the concrete pours, it won't come up. And the material that I pulled away from the edge, I'll just put back up against here. I'll come back behind and kind of tamp it in place. Do that on each end. And then when I pour, this can expand and contract all at once. Now there's one critical thing left to do. Now some of you would be tempted to just pour your concrete and be done. And personally, I think that's going to be a huge mistake. And the reason is, is it's brittle. So concrete is very strong in a compressive force. But when it comes to flexing or tensile strength, it's very, very weak. And with that, I'm expecting with the freeze and thaw on this ground being clay-based, and, and I shouldn't say freeze-thaw here, but more of the dry summer dry out and the rainy spring uh, expansion of the clay, I'm gonna experience some of those forces. I'm not concerned about compression because concrete's got good compressive force and it's also got good shear force. But when it comes to bending or tensile strength and pulling apart, it's very, very brittle. So we solve that with wire mesh and rebar. By putting that rebar and wire mesh in here, it's gonna double the strength it has and its flexion or its tensile strength so that over the years, this doesn't crumble, break and, and fall apart because of those forces on it. Now, the wire mesh I'm using, six by six wire mesh, and the rebar I'm using is what they call three bar, or it's three eighths. So come along, I'll show you how I'm gonna do all this. So I got my wire mesh here, it's six by six, it's three and a half feet wide by seven foot long. Now, my pour is gonna be 10 inches, and I'm just gonna take and mark off eight inches, so I have an inch on each side for lay ray. And all I'm doing is taking this liquid paint marker here and marking off eight inches where I need to cut and it just so happens I can get four pieces out of each sheet then I just take my bolt cutters and cut on the white line and just like that I got my first one cut now I have to cut this to length but next we'll get the rebar okay I got all my rebar cut to size now how I'm gonna put these together is it's gonna get two pieces of rebar to each one and two pieces of mesh. And you can see how the mesh, I cut it on this edge and I cut it on that edge. I'm gonna offset them like this when I do it. I'm gonna use six inch wire ties only because they didn't have four inch and a twister. Put this rebar in here, put this over the top. 
And when I'm done, I want to make sure I get these ties pushed down so they're not sticking up. Otherwise, they'll stick up out of the concrete. Take and sandwich the rebar in between here. What I'm going to do is tie little legs on these because I don't want to, I don't have any way to, to suspend these in the form. I don't have any chairs, or they call them chairs, the little plastic chairs to put on it or anything. So instead I cut rebar at three inches and I'll put three on each side. Alrighty, the time's finally come. Got some concrete bags stacked up here. We're getting ready to pour. I got these cages all in and I designed them so I'd have about an inch on the sides and I got it to where I got about a half inch on the ends. I probably should have cut them a little shorter where I had an inch all the way around, but it kind of worked out that way for some of them to be even on the squares. So that's how I did it. So they're all in there. The legs are on there. They're sitting there tight. We're ready to pour. And for this, I got a smaller mixer than what I used for the post. One, so I could get it back here close to it, and two, I didn't need that. So I rented this from Lowe's. It's a medium size uh, mixer. It can hold up to four bags. These take roughly, I'm hoping, about three bags. And I've already got one bag in there because it was tearing, so I just put it in there. But typically you're supposed to put water in first and then add your cement. My original plan with this was to mix it in here and then just take it over, wheel it, and dump it in. But it's not going to work. I got a five gallon bucket and basically it's 15 inches on the inside. So every three inches is a gallon. So I got every three inches marked as one, two, three, four. Uh, so I know how many gallons to put in and so I can be consistent. I'm going to make this mix a little on the wet side so that it'll uh, flow and fill in there really well and give me a little more working time. I'm going to start with about a gallon and a half of water and see how that does. You can always add more water, but when you add too much, it's a real pain in the butt. The max this will hold is four. I'm just cutting the tops off so I can add this while it's mixing. That's too dry, you can already see. So I'm gonna start out, add, I'm gonna add another half a gallon. While this does a pretty good job of mixing, you're still gonna have to take a shovel and go in the back and scrape it off because the dry tends to hit, go to the bottom and stick and it doesn't get it mixed. You can tell when it's all good and mixed because if you look to the back, it'll all fall off the back of it. And if it doesn't, you know you got a cake back there and you got to kind of dig it off. And then we just shovel it in. Now I'm just going to take my magnesium float and kind of smoosh it down into the edges and the sides. Now I'm just going to take my Makita Sawzall, no blade in it, and this will be my vibrator. And when I got part of it done, I start to float. And the excess, I just move down the path here. It's all done. Now I just take my float and float it out. Again, if I have too much, I just throw it out. If I got too little, I can go get some more. I always try to keep my edges clean so that my float is right down on the edge. Now what I'm doing is I got it flat by doing this really good against the forms. Now what I'm doing is just lightly floating over it and actually making a little bit higher than what it needs to be because it's kind of wet. As wet as this is, it'll shrink down as the water evaporates and it'll be too low. Just like that. As you can see, I didn't have much left, so 
just a hair under three bags. Now I always make sure I clean my instruments or tools, if you will, between so that concrete doesn't dry on them and get built up and they stay clean. Now it's just rinse and repeat for the last two. Well, they've all been floated and this is the last one and I'm putting a steel trowel finish on. And what does that mean? Well, the other float is just a magnesium float and basically just gives you kind of a rough finish. When you use a steel trowel, it'll give you a glass smooth finish. Now, how do you know when to start this? Because you don't want to do it right after you do your float unless your concrete mix is very, very, very dry. So what you need to do is let it sit. And this has been sitting oh, a good couple hours. You just come over and touch it, barely get anything on your fingers. That's one way to tell. See those little skip marks? That's because the edges of the form have gravel and sand on them. Now this is still wet enough. I'm scraping it off and just throwing it back into my mix here. That's why when I floated, I wanted it to be just a little high so when the water evaporated, it would sink down a little bit or settle down. And two, I wanted it so there's just a fraction over my form for when I steel trowel so it makes it easier. But you're gonna keep a low angle. And what you're gonna do to start, you're gonna have kind of a steep angle at first to start. And that's mainly just to bring up, what you're looking for is to bring up that Portland cement or the cream they call it to get the finish. And then when you've got that accomplished, you're gonna keep a low angle. And I'm putting a fair amount of pressure on here when I do it to get started. But you can see how this looks dry and now all of a sudden I got this wet look to it and as I get to where I want I'll do a lighter touch for my final final go at it this little edge here and here where I got nothing it's not a problem you just work the float back and forth to get the mix to fill that hole or void and then when you do, you just go over it and finalize it. Now what I'll do is I'll finish getting this steel trout like this. I'll let it set probably 20, 30 minutes or so. And I'll come back and do one final one and it'll get glass smooth. And these little bubbles that are popping out, it'll get rid of those. This is what I wanted to do when I poured the posts. But it got ahead of me or got away from me. And they dried too much or set up too much and cured too much for me to do this. Because when I tried to do it, there was just nothing there and it just wouldn't do it. For my final pass, it's light, shallow angle. All one motion. Now what I'm going to attempt to do is pull the sides of the forms off. It's been three hours since I poured this one. It ought to be set up enough to hold its shape. And if it is, what I'm wanting to do is try and float the edge with my magnesium float and get it floated real smooth. Then I'll come back over it with the steel trowel. We're going to do this side first because if it screws up, it's on my neighbor's side. I won't see it. I'm going to pull it off this way because if I go up, it's liable to crack the edge and I don't want that. Okay, now we'll try and float that, see how it looks. I'm just using the magnesium float that I used to float the top. Okay, I did both sides. I'm just going to do one final pass over the top. I don't think I'm going to do it on those two because you saw how that busted out here. It's a fine line between setup to where it's holding and not too set up to where you can work it and honestly with this sack creek i think you just don't have as good a workability as if you got concrete from say out of a concrete truck when this sets up it's going to be a glass finish it's the next morning they still look wet like they're not cured but 
They are hard. And yes, you're correct. They are not cured. In case you didn't know, it takes 28 days for concrete to fully cure. So if you ever see anybody out pouring a big slab or, you know, like for a foundation and then you see them not do anything for quite a while, well, it's because they're waiting for it to fully cure. So I'm happy with the finish. The steel trial finish came out really well on these last three. And I say these last three because you'll see here in a minute the other six I poured last week. I didn't get the camera turned on. I got under a time crunch trying to hurry and get things. I just never got the camera on but as you saw I took the forms off of this particular one here and floated it but I didn't do it on the last two and the reason is is because it was busting up my edges and I'll show you on the first ones I did some areas where it did it really bad and I'll give you a kind of my thought as to why the difference here now you might be thinking well if you took your edger along there you wouldn't have had that issue and you're right but I didn't because I wanted a sharp edge for when I steel troweled. If you've ever done any concrete work and used an edger and tried to steel trowel afterwards, while well, you can edge and you'll get it steel troweled, there'll be an, a part of it that won't get troweled with, you know, be steel troweled. And in order to do it, you really got to press hard, smash it out, and you're gonna take your edge off anyway. So that's why I didn't do that. Overall, I'm really happy with how my uh, reciprocating saw worked as a vibrator to get the edges filled in. I mean, uh, I'm probably gonna have to go, I know I'm gonna have to go back and fix some and I'll talk about that here in a second But I mean for the most part it did a really good job now. I didn't get a smooth finish on the edges On this pour like I did the the posts and the reason is, is for these I use dimensional lubber That's already kind of smooth whereas I use plywood here So I've got others I have to do and I must try sanding those forms and see if it makes a difference and yes, I did save the forms because why not? They're still good and it'll save me a lot of time going forward because now I don't have to make any. And one other tip uh, when you pour concrete. So I poured this last night or yesterday and today they're not fully cured and they're still wet looking. The tip is for the next two, three, four days, if you wet them down, it'll help the curing process, especially in the summer when it's really, really hot. Because if these dry out and cure too quick, they can become a little more brittle than they should be. Uh, I'm expecting rain today, so I'm not watering anything. As you can see, the finish come out on that really nice. I'll show you the ones I poured before that uh, are a little more cured, and you can see just how well it looks when it's cured. So here's one that I poured last week, and you can see now it's cured. It's a nice, slick, smooth finish. When you compare it to what the post looks like when I just used a uh, magnesium float. Now I did a steel trowel because I, it kind of seals the surface and that's why I wanted these posts steel troweled. So it kind of wanted it to be a nice smooth surface like this so stuff doesn't hang up on it, dirt, water, whatever. And two, it seals the surface up. Now you can see as I scan along this one here, yes, I've got some little voids or pits, if you will, or air bubbles, but for the most part, it did a really, really good job. I mean, if you've done any concrete work in that, you'd have to agree that's a pretty good job as far as getting the bubbles out. Now, let's go down and look at the first ones I poured and point out some issues there. These first three, I did the same thing as I did to that one down there, and that is I pulled the edge of the forms off and tried to float the edges and then and fix it that way. But as I'm showing you here, I had some really bad breakouts and tear outs in the corners that I'm gonna have to try and go back and fix and repair so they look a little better. And my thought was as to why it happened on these three was because I waited too long before I took the forms off. Uh, time was getting away from me. I come back, I pulled these off, and on this one here, it actually did a fairly good job of floating the edge, but I had real issues when it come to breaking out the corners. And so I thought to myself, well, it's because I waited too long. So on that one down there, I didn't wait near as long. In fact, when I was doing that one, I could see the edge of the concrete moving. So it was still kind of squishy, if you will. This was not, it was hard when I did it. So I thought, well, if I do it sooner, it'll be easier. Well, it was easier to float this, but it still had issues with the break out of the corner, so I just stopped. When I had, I did these three and had so many issues, for the next three, I didn't do it. And again, the edges come out pretty nice. But uh, for all in all, I'm really happy with the steel trowel finish that come out on all of these. Like I say, I just wish I could have done that on the post, so I'd had a matching surfaces, and two, like I said, it helps seal it. So let's go over a couple mistakes that were made uh, during this part of the project. And just so you know, 
mistakes happen, whether you're a DIY or professional. Ask somebody who's a professional, carpenter, roofer. Mistakes are made and they have to fix them. So it's gonna happen. But as I've already pointed out, the first mistake was when I took the forms off and it broke those edges up. Now, my thinking of why that happened, other than I thought I did it too late on them, uh, is the concrete that I used. Using the sackcrete, it's got much smaller gravel and that as an aggregate in it, whereas the stuff you get out of the concrete truck has much bigger stone and aggregate in it, and probably I think has a little more Portland in it. And so uh, those tend to uh, do a really good job when you pull the forms off and float them, because I've done some concrete work where I've had a concrete truck come and pour, and it does work really nice. So that's my thought. It had to do with this sack creep. But like I said, I got to have a three yard minimum, and this wasn't three yards, so I couldn't really get a truck. The second mistake that was made, and I really want you to pay attention to this so you don't do it, is getting your mix too wet. Somewhere on this fourth section, I screwed up on my water. I got way too much water in there. Uh, those were going along really nice, and I thought, well, the next one I want a little wetter, but somehow I got way too much water in it. So I had that four bag mixer, and I had so much water in there, I could only get about two, two and a half bags in there, and it was just soup. So in order to try and uh, fix that, I actually put another two bags in my wheelbarrow and took some of that soupy slop into the wheelbarrow, mix that up, and I did that back and forth until I had it much more consistent and wasn't as sloppy wet. And so when I poured, the problem was, is the aggregate separated out. As you're getting this close up along this edge, you can see all the sand and gravel separated out along the edge. Now this stuff is hard, it's not flaking off. You can see I'm rubbing, it's not flaking off. It's, it's firm and held in there. But because it was so wet, the aggregate, uh, when I vibrated it with the reciprocating saw, the aggregate all separated out against the edge like that. Um, and so that's why that did that. So you must be careful as to how much water you're putting in. Just remember, you can always add more water. It's tough to get that water out. So the next question you're probably asking yourself is, well, how does it look? Uh, when you step back and look at it as a whole. Well, here's some scanning pictures of it looking down the edges. And you can see I'm, I'm pretty happy. I mean, yes, I'd love to have it absolutely perfectly straight, but it's really pretty good. Now, some of it's got some bows uh, out and in, and some of that is because when I had the form set, a couple days went by and it had rained, and the rain had caused that plywood to warp, and there really wasn't much I was going to be able to do to fix that. But for the most part, uh, it looks actually pretty good. Once I get the fence on, the dirt backfilled in these, and the grass grown up, you probably won't even be able to tell. Now you can see that some of them look a little twisted, and that's because when uh, on a couple of uh, my fence posts, the forms uh, shifted and twisted a little. And so you can tell which one those are, because as it goes down, as you look down the edge, you can see you can actually, it kind of sticks out that it was a little twisted. And this looks like something you might do at your house. Leave me a comment down below if you're thinking about it or if you've done it. Let me, leave me a comment as to how it turned out. Did yours turn out way better than mine? I'd love to hear it. Just remember the mistakes I made, don't make them. And going forward, now that I know these mistakes, I've still got plenty to do. I'll be quite mindful of that. And so it can only get better the more times you do it. That's the difference between an amateur and a professional, the more times you do it. And if you're wondering how the rest of this fence is going to turn out when it's all said and done, hit the subscribe button down below and the bell notification so when that video comes out, you'll be notified and you can see it. And if you've been wondering where to get some of this DIY merchandise that you see me wear in this video, I have a link down below uh, where you can go and check out these designs. I've got other designs and I've just added a couple new ones, in fact. So I've got just a couple more details, small little details to do in order to finish up this part of the project. And if you want to know more about how I did this concrete pour on these posts, I'll have a link for that video also. You can go see how I over-engineered and over-constructed those also. So until our next project, happy DIYing.